I will. Uh, hey, it's a real it's a real delight to engage you. Yes, it's nice to actually talk to you in person. So yeah, so how, sort sort of yeah, sort of in person. COVID in person. Yeah, well, it's it'll have changed some things for the better, I think. Um, are you in Northern Ontario? Well, no. Northern Ontario is, we're north of the city. Uh, we're about, I don't know, three hours north of Toronto, but that's really still Southern Ontario. Northern Ontario is another 500 miles. Hudson Bay. Hudson's Bay, yeah. Well, not even that far, but uh, like... Hudson's Bay, geez, I don't know, that's probably a thousand miles from here. I, I mean, it's a long way. Ontario is huge, man. It's just, it takes three days to drive across Ontario. To drive Big, north and south? Uh, no, to drive east-west. Wow, three days. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. I'm, tr I'm trying to picture that in my head, and uh, I guess I got to look at a map. Yeah. How long have you been in that area? Well, uh, on and off. I lived here in the 70s, and then I went back to the States. Um, and then I came back to Buffalo in 82. And then I moved back up here in 92, 92, 93, when I got married. Yeah. So I've been here since then. And spent some time uh, studying at Simon Fraser. Well, that was back in the 60s. Yeah, I first came to Canada from California to Vancouver in 1966. And I enrolled in Simon Fraser in 67. And I was there for a year and a half, I guess. Um, maybe two years. And ended up back out in Montreal, and then I bounced around a lot, you know, those were the days. But, but, born, days. but born in California. Yeah, oh yeah, Riverside. Is that right, Riverside, California, wow. No kidding, I'm a Riverside right. boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, my cousin has property in Phelan, near Victorville. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, we're going to talk about Jack Clark today. Nothing matters. Okay. I love to talk about Jack. <laughs> I was hoping that would be the case. Um, his birthday his birthday was the twenty first, so what's the day? I don't know. Twenty fourth. He would have been eighty, I think. Is that all? Eighty? Yeah. He was not a oh wait, sorry, no, eighty. No, I'm sorry. Eighty five. Well, an introduction to a series of recordings of poems in the recent edition of Sejura magazine says that poet Jack Clark, who died in 1992, was, quote, grounded in an extensive scholarship into the history and life of myth. And his work, according to Albert Cook, who recruited him for the new SUNY Buffalo English Department in 1963, moved as far beyond his friend and mentor, Charles Olson, as Olson had moved beyond Ezra Pound. Um, Jack Clark taught at SUNY Buffalo for 29 years. In addition, your introduction goes on to say, William Blake gave Clark his love and passion for myth and his commitment to, as Blake urged, create a system rather than be enslaved by another man. Clark's poetry is the site of deep thinking through myth toward an energetic cosmology. You were Jack's student, and is it true you're his literary executor? Yeah, that's true. So um, how did you first get connected with Jack Clark? Tell us about that. Um, well, it's kind of, it's funny actually, because years later, I, I, I moved to Buffalo in uh, 82. Um, I had worked in various industrial situations for a number of years and um, we've then gone back to school at UC Santa Cruz to finish my BA. And then in 82, I moved out to Buffalo to join the, the graduate program at, at Buffalo. It turns out that when I had been at Simon Fraser, I'd completely forgotten this. I, I had actually met Jack, Jack and Al Glover, and I think someone else. They were the part of the Institute of Further Studies had come out at Robin's invitation to Simon Fraser to 
do some lectures and presentations and stuff. And uh, I had met Jack then, and I'd completely forgotten about it, except when I was going through his correspondence, I discovered a postcard from me to Jack <laughs> from like 1968. Uh, anyway, so that's... I. I when I when I came to Buffalo, I was primarily concerned to work in the poetry collection, and I was also, as so many others were, uh, looking for some kind of uh, relationship with Robert Creeley, who had been there for a long time. He, of course, wasn't there when I got there. Those were the days when Bob was, you know, either he was always somewhere else. He was in Norway or. Arizona or I mean New Mexico or wherever he was moving all over the place and he would be in Buffalo for a term and then he'd be gone again um, but so he wasn't there when I got there and I was looking around for the connections and I guess I met Jack I met Bob Birdall first of all because I went to the poetry collection um, and Birdall that was the year that Ed Sanders did the Olson Memorial Lectures. Uh, and Birdolf invited me to his house for a post-lecture party. And that's where I met Jack. And we immediately hit it off because of our common interests in Charles Olson and William Blake and you know, on and on and on. We, um, it was, yeah, it was like instantaneous, instantaneous as he said. Instantaneous. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of my nine-year-old daughter who says, "Literary, uh, that's yeah. literary, that's yeah. literary effect." Um, yeah. You say in this introduction, "quote Jack's poetry asks you, the reader, to abandon yourself, to engage with what you don't know and can't understand, and enter a path of transformative gnosis." Yes, I did say that. Why don't you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, Jack, Jack's poetry is, uh, he was a teacher and his poetry is the mode through which he taught primarily. I mean, he had classes and stuff at school, but he engaged poetry not as some mode of expression, but as a mode of exploring realms of knowledge that otherwise are unavailable. Uh, poetry is a, a particular entrance into those modes of knowledge because of the, of the complex ways that it is able to manipulate language into modes of meaning not otherwise available to us. So the transformative gnosis is, is, man, it's like when you go to a teacher, you don't expect to like have it all laid out to you, right? Like you expect to engage and learn and, you know, be hit over the head when you don't get it and brought along. And that's what Jack does with his poetry. He, he has something to teach us that we don't already know. And he, the invitation is to enter into a, a, pro, a prolonged and engaged relationship with him and his work. And if you do that, it'll blow your mind. I mean, literally, that's what you say, blow your mind, right? I mean, it, it means that it opens you into places that you weren't before. When I hear your answer, I think about poets, you know, who can be considered part of this tradition. William Carlos Williams, for example, who said he wrote to figure out what he thought. So using the poem uh, as an act of discovery to go to realms beyond the, beyond the heart and mind, beyond the intellect that would not necessarily be as readily available as as other modes. Do you think that's fair to put Jack into, into that kind of uh, <laughs> tradition and method? Absolutely. I mean, even more than Williams, um, Jack, starting in the 70s, uh, after, soon after Olson died, Jack, I mean, he started before that, but 
he really engaged in a process of writing poetry that where that's all he did was write poetry every day he would sit down and he would write six seven eight sonnets um all based on the reading that he was doing the thinking that he was doing the the intellectual exploration that he was doing he didn't write essays he didn't write academic papers he didn't do any of that stuff he just wrote poetry his whole intellectual universe is in poetry um and you can you can read the the notebooks at uh at ub uh, are astonishing like they just every day he sits down and he starts writing um and that's where his thinking is it's nowhere else it's right there it's in the poetry using using what poetry has to offer in terms of 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 technique um to get beyond even what he already knows he's thinking with poetry it was an exploration right a, 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 a remarkable engagement a protracted engagement i don't know of anybody else who put their whole intellectual life into poetry quite the way he did mm -hmm. so poetry is a method um as a way of knowing the world and um you know you you say you don't necessarily know of someone who uh who did it in this way but you studied with robin blazer who put poetry on a, on a level of knowing the world like sociology or philosophy or science and that um if one did not include poetry um in one's life that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a poet but reading poetry and reading poetry written at a deep level like someone like jack clark or I would add Nate Mackey, Charles Olson, Brenda Hillman. I mean, you could go on, Michael McClure, Sam Hamill, you can go on and on. But you, so you studied with Blazer who believed this. So you found yourself attracted to those folks who were using this method as a very deep way of understanding how the world works. Yes, I would draw a distinction between what Jack, between Jack and Robin. Uh, I mean, they, they admired each other endlessly, uh, loved each other, uh, loved each other's minds. Um, and celebrated each other, but Robin, Robin was an intellectual in a way that Jack wasn't. You know, Robin, God, I love. I mean, Robin shaped my intellectual life. Um, and uh, God, if I could write like Robin, <laughs> I'd be so happy. I mean, his essays are just uh, absolutely brilliant, and and. even in some way more i mean i shouldn't i don't want to compare him with duncan or whatever i'm just saying that robin robin had this idea rob creeley came to me once and he said you know blazer's got this idea of, of intellect that comes out of like oxford or someplace and and bob was like you know what's that all about because that's not his mode at all robin was meticulous in his intellectual engagement and he if you read his essays, they're at research to the nines, and they are uh, they're notated there. I mean, it's an intellectual, it's a, a recognizable intellectual engagement through the essay form. Um, but Jack never went there. He never went there. He every ounce of his energy went into the poem. Went into the poem. He didn't. I mean, and I'm not putting down Robin in any way. Um, or his poetry or his essay. I'm just saying there was a different approach and in some ways a different result. Um, because Jack's, well, Jack's work, it never finishes because he dies, right? And, and uh, he's in the midst of writing an, an epic <laughs> called In the Analogy, which is an epic made up of sonnets, which is, think about that. That's like a brilliant, that's just brilliant, you know? You, you bring the two warring forms together in a marriage that's alchemical in its in its result, and you get this. But every ounce of his thinking went into those poems. Uh, it didn't go anywhere else. You, you know, it's a few thoughts come up in your response. Uh, one of them is, would we want to talk about comparing Blazer and Duncan? Uh, you'd be the person to do it because you uh, edited the HD book 
by Robert yeah. Duncan. So, I mean, that's gigantic. And just taking on that project gave you a huge sense of who Duncan was. And of course, studied with Robin Blazer. Uh, that's one thought. The other, th one, of, one of the other thoughts is that here's a guy, Jack Clark, who writes seven or eight sonnets at least every day, and then makes you the literary executor. So you have to go through all this stuff, which is no easy task and be able to take the honey from that and release it as a, as a good literary executor would do. So uh, another thought. And then the, the third thing is that this, um, this phrase, um, uh, transformative gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, it seems to me um, has much in common, and, and forgive me, I'm not a Buddhist, and I'm guessing that you're not a Buddhist, but we understand uh, something of the notion of a Dharma transmission. Do you think there are similarities in what Jack does with his poetry and the way you describe it and a Dharma transmission? Yeah, I think that's probably a reasonable connection to me. Uh, I use I use the word gnosis. I guess I started using that when uh, Benjamin Hollander and I were going back and forth um, years ago before he died uh, about the particular possibilities of transmission that poetry makes available. Not everyone is able to use those possibilities, um, but they're there, they're available. And it has to do with sonal structures and uh, vibration and sound and rhythm. Um, you know, Pound's great tripartite division into meloporia, phonoporia, and logoporia, the mind, the sound, and the, and the, and the vision. Um, that, that experience is what I would call gnosis, which is that you know something. <laughs> you know it through every cell in your body. You know it resonates. You resonate with that knowledge. It's not an intellectual thing. It's not even necessarily something that you can immediately articulate, but you know it. Um, like the, I mean, I used to argue with, I would argue with Jack about Gnosticism because, um, I mean, there's issues with Gnosticisms. I mean, traditional historic Gnosticism is a dualistic mode of looking at things and the, and the obviously dualism is not where you want to end up. Um, but Jack always would move beyond that and clarify, it's not, that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the mode of knowledge. Um, and that's what's important, not any philosophy or religious affiliation or whatever, you know, it's, that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is the knowledge and how that knowledge is accessed. Um, I mean, I, 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 I always, I tell the story, it's probably boring. Anybody's heard it a million times by now, but when I was an undergraduate at uh, UC Riverside in like 1964, and I was taking English 1A or 1B, I don't know which one it was. It was, you know, they had that, you got your two courses, their comp courses, they do poetry and the novel, and then they do the plays and whatever. Well, I walked into this classroom with 300 other students and on the board, the professor, who I don't even know who he was, he had written out, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chicken. And I saw that, <laughs> I'm about to cry right now. It just shattered me, it shattered me. I was, it was like, I knew something then that I'd never knew before. Um, and I, I couldn't have known it any other way. Uh, it was this profound knowledge about me, existence, God, you know, rain, chickens, the whole thing. It was all right there. And um, poetry can do that. that but who, no, what else can do that? You know, you can't do that with, I mean, I, I, I was going to say you can't do it with philosophy. Well, you, it depends on who you're reading, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of philosophy that approaches poetry. I was hearing some kind of rattling sound for a minute there. I don't know what was what was creating that. Oh, sorry. 
One of the, the things that I'm interested in, in figuring out and giving folks a sense to try and figure out who Jack was, and I think this is, this is really underestimated in that when a person is dealing with that kind of intelligence as we are, um, and in, in such a way that it is embodied, it's not simply the intellect, but there's a huge amount of emotion in there. It's not um, disembodied intellectualism. It is, it is the opposite. It is embodied intellectualism. And um, it, that is, I think, still really not quite understood. As, and even in the deepest uh, literary circles at this time, it's still not quite understood. I think McClure was one of those poets. And, um, and, and I'm wondering about the jazz connection because he was, he was a drummer, was he not? No, he was, uh, he started off on trumpet and uh, like he, his mom was a music teacher and she made sure that the family was a band. He told me about this. So everybody in the family had to play a different instrument because That's she right. wanted a damn band in the house. You mentioned um, that in the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so he started off on trumpet, but then he uh, moved to piano. He, be he became a, just a terrific jazz keyboardist. I mean, he would, he could go for hours improvising on the piano, brilliantly improvising on the piano. And at the end of his life, he took up the xylophone as well and was really good on that. Um, but the, but the piano, yeah, that was his main, and the accordion. He loved to play accordion. Um, I have one of his old accordions, but it doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. So I don't know where, where I was. Um, so the music, disembodied, disembodied nature, or the in this case, the embodied nature of his his uh, poetry, his, his art, his artwork, um, I think how it is uh, informed by jazz, I think is the question. Yeah, and, and music, the, the fact that, that music itself is a mode of knowledge, right? That you don't, it's, you listen to, especially, I mean, well, I shouldn't say especially, but, but jazz is a incredible mode of knowledge. And Jack grew up during a period when jazz was at its most brilliant intellectual peak, you know, during the sixties, that whole avant-garde period with Coltrane and Dolphy and, Miles Davis and Charles Mingus and I mean it was just it was so rich with knowledge of people putting it out there um, and he was he was he he was part of that he understood that he asked well he was very very close friends with Harvey Brown and um, Harvey Brown uh, inherited a bunch of money when he turned 21 and one of the things that he did with that money was to uh, start a recording studio in New York, and he recorded, oh, Don Cherry and a whole bunch of other jazz musicians. And so Jack was plugged into all that stuff and knew those guys. I mean, he was, he was, uh, 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 I don't know how close they were, but he, he certainly knew them. Um, so the music, it was the, the it was the, I, I guess it's the, it's the, what he gets from Olson that's most important is the idea of never looking back, of uh, that you keep going, that, that, that poetry opens and then it opens some more and then it opens some more. So you don't repeat, you continue to open yourself to the improvisational possibilities of the work that you're engaged in, which will take you places that you hadn't anticipated, where you'll learn things. This is another part from the introduction. The, uh, the music is part of an incantatory liturgy, an invocation, poetry's old job before it got turned into creative writing and theory. <laughs> 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 the, the dispatches from the poetry wars is, <laughs> continues to rear its gnarled head. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
Um, he, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm You're sorry. reaching I'm because I don't think you can say it any more clearly than that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm just thinking about that. That was kind of a closed ended question there, wasn't it? <laughs> well, what about I was reading something the other day on myth. You know, that it that nobody knows for sure how all this stuff comes to us, where it starts, but the the one proposal, one serious proposal is that the 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 myth, the muthos, as Olson pointed out, the muthos comes out of the physical the physical dance of a ritual, which has to do with a relationship and engagement with the sacred. So you start off with the, the physical rhythmic dance, the body engaged. And then from that, the mouth begins to speak um, rhythmically along with the body. And that's the muthos. Yeah, I don't know. Now, now you say none of us really knows how this works, but Barrett Watton would say that language poetry came around in the 1970s to um, rescue poetry from myth. I know Creeley would say that too. Um, it was an argument I had with him. Well, whatever. He can say whatever he wants to say. <laughs> you know, he's Barrett. That's what he likes to do. He... You, you disagree with this, though. And, and my question to you is, um, you know, how can all the experience, how can the experience of indigenous people all over the world and their reliance on myth be rejected by any intelligent person? Doesn't that put that kind of person who rejects myth on the same level as people a hundred years ago or less who called uh, indigenous people savages? Have, 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 has that state of mind not advanced beyond that kind of concept, which in, in 2021 would seem to me to be a very vulgar and limited one? Well, it certainly would be, but I don't know if I would attribute that to Barry. Um, he's, he's, when, he, when he makes that proposition, I don't think he's discounting what goes on in indigenous cultures. I think he's saying that our culture is not that culture. Um, we are post-industrial, whatever we are, and therefore we no longer have meaningful access. I, I would think he would say something like that. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm trying to be generous here. Um, I know that Creeley, Creeley was just, I know he was looking for something hard. He was looking for a hard knowledge, you know, hard edged knowledge. And he thought myth was soft. Um, but then I don't know that he, well, that was also all tied up with the argument about Olson and who Olson was. Was Olson a, a poet of historical geography or was he a, a poet of mythic reality? Um, Bob went for the historic business and ruled out the rest of it. Uh, and that was, I don't know, you know, we could talk for an hour about his relationship to Olson and what that was all about. But we, but, but we could also talk about your feeling about how he pushed the art past um, where Olson had it. In fact, as far past Olson as Olson had pushed it beyond pound. Yes, I think that for Jack, the, the issue was to take poetry to what Blake called the fourfold, where you literally become the prophetic voice of poetry. That's who you are. You are that prophetic voice. You know, um, that's the, the the fourfold, the fourfold knowledge of Jerusalem, where you literally are not thinking about it. You're not transcribing it from some other knowledge into poetry. You are the voice of that. It's a it's a that's transformative gnosis. You know. Um, and, and that's where that's what like Jack's Jack loved Olson. I mean, he was loved him deeply and profoundly. But he did 
acknowledge that he didn't think Olson was successful in what he set out to do, that he didn't quite get there. Um, and where he didn't get, I think, was into the fourfold as a, as a, as a home, as a home from which he spoke. Let's go to some of Jack's poems. If I can do this properly, I can share screen and I could go to the piece and uh, let me know. Can, can you see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, from Sejura Magazine, completing the circuit of Circe. Um, I'm gonna just play this and he's, uh, and Jack is reading his poems backed up by uh, Charlie Keel, right? Kyle. 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 Cersei. Sing to her of what has happened to her creation. Don't let it go back to her broken up. Don't let her hear her song broken up. The words falling dead in the divine analogy. It is a chance, her gift, but we let it slip through without hearing it. These living words are her synovial fluid. Punk fluid, the plasmatic sing of to ignite the soma, paoma, homer, used to write with his words, the lost sinews of Zeus, our sin, that we haven't gotten them back for her, the song of Circe lost in the analogy. We let the words go back to her unchanged, a blockage in the circulation of her bodily fluid, the collagen of our world wasted on the future. The first time this mixture has been made available. <laughs> wow. I think it's the first poem ever that I've seen a reference to Circe and plasmatics in the same poem. Yeah, I know. Well, that was Jack. Hey, he brought all the worlds together, you know, all uh, of them. The plasmatics were led by Wendy O. Williams, who, as I recall, would, would destroy things on stage, went topless with uh, pieces of electrical tape going over her nipples. Am I getting this right from the 80s? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> But it was the um, it was the it was the address to song that he was. You know, I. It's all about it's all about. Opening yourself to the voice. Of the goddess, in this case, Circe. It's all about opening yourself to the knowledge that's more than you, that can speak through you if you don't try to turn it into a poem or turn it into something that you have a preconceived notion of. Um, I mean, obviously he's writing in sonnets, so there's a, there's a, a, a it's not a contradiction, it's a, it's a beautiful marriage actually, <laughs> but it is to take the, to take that, limited form that has traditionally defined the, the individual lyric voice in, in English language poetry and to turn it into a, a, a megaphone for that which is beyond the individual voice. What would you- I don't- Sorry, go ahead. I, I would- one question that goes through my head is that by invoking Circe, uh, we then are um, in the realm of that of myth, of transformative gnosis. You know, you you go to um, events run by indigenous people, and they invoke the ancestors. They, you know, you can yell out your ancestor out loud to invoke them to bring their spirit and essence into the room. And I think that's something that's shared with all indigenous cultures, but would not necessarily be shared by people who come from uh, a culture. Whose, uh, whose ultimate expression might be seen in TikTok, for, for, for instance. Yes, for, for instance, or Facebook. Or Facebook, right. Um, but um, the first time this mixture has been made available, how, what would your take on that be? 
Well, he's saying that the opportunity, this is the first time that the opportunity has been made available to us. The opportunity to get beyond the blockage and the circulation of her bodily fluids. We have the opportunity now, which we've wasted, but this is the first time that the mixture has been made available, he's saying. Now, he's arguing, the argument there is that we, we are at a point where poetry, where we've returned in a sense, Ralph Mott always uh, argued that, um, that, that postmodern was, the, was basically a, a, re, a, redo, a redo of the, of the archaic. So the archaic, which, which we lost around the time of Homer, um, the possibility of the, of the meaning that circulated in the archaic is now available to us again for the first time. Because we, we, we now have the ability to step beyond the particular episteme of, of modernism um, and open ourselves to other circulations of energy beyond that. A reunification of logos and mythos. Yeah, yeah. But we're not doing it. And he's, that's, he's saying we're not doing it. We're wasting it. <laughs> we're wasting it. Come on, get back, Barry. Come on, Creeley, get with it. You know? <laughs> Okay, how about, let's see if we can pull up another poem here. Ionic residue. Facing the shadow is the measure of belief. One's line is no stronger than the persuasion. Why the form of evil is so important to American writing. The locus of perception, seeing the dawn, cannot be twisted back by law. The forgiven is cosmological. The strength to draw the line across the former deep, so the shadow is removed by location, projected as illusion 110,000 years ago, when the magnetic polarity shifted briefly, an event of art that created the prior form of Traum only to adjust Earth's homeostatic equilibrium so we could all continue breathing. So the point would be to get off the archetypal entropy. An American will blame himself for anything. <laughs> oh, shit. There's a lot in there, man. There's a lot in there, yeah. We're talking yeah. over one of the base, too. I love and that. you got it. You can't. You cannot ignore. Like when you listen to that, we're listening to the words, but we're actually hearing Charlie as well. And it's the it's the weaving together of the words and the music that create this extraordinary sense of meaning, um, which you can pursue in terms of interpreting the language, but you can also pursue in terms of listening to what the music and words are creating in you. That meaning is not necessarily understanding. Meaning is being in relation to. He mentions cosmology in that, and you talked about energetic cosmology in the introduction. Cosmology is is how you see, you know, how does the world work? What's the existence of it? It engages questions like, what's the purpose of life? So, can you have some sense of how to articulate Jack Clark's cosmo his energetic cosmology? Um, <laughs> boy, you ask the easy questions, don't you? <laughs> you know, Robin Blazer said the same exact thing. You ask the toughies. <laughs> And yeah. no one's no one's going to pin you down and say, "Well, you said this." You know, we know what, what you think of it today, what comes to your mind, and you know, we realize that in a week, it might be different and may be more articulate than you can be now. But you know, take I, it I don't, I I don't know that I can articulate 
Okay. Jack, in those in these poems, there's a uh, a definite sense that information is coming into the poem from elsewhere. That the, that Jack is plugged into a mode of knowledge that is informing the particularities of articulation, the way the world is being articulated in the poems. It's not a given. It's deeply influenced by Blake. There's no question about that. I mean, Jack's sense of Blake's understanding of Jerusalem and the role of the mythical Jesus is, he's totally there. Like he, but he's there in a way that always pushes beyond that articulation towards some specific or particular understanding of the structure of our engagement with the world of what's happening to us and how we're engaged with that. That's um, beyond Blake. I mean, it's, it's, it's Jack. <laughs> that's the whole point. He brings all this stuff in, you know, the Greek myths, the Northern European myths, African myths, he brings in knowledge from all over. If you look at those bibliographies that I attached to the to the poetry, you can see the incredible range of reading and knowledge that is behind every word. Um, and what he does is to try to locate us in a process that's unfolding that we can only know as it's unfolding. So we have to pay attention to, to, to what it is that is going on. Attention, you know, attention. <laughs> and in that, in that process, build a soul. Yes, well, yes, reveal a soul. Yeah, reveal it. Apophenestai, right, Olson says, you know, when the angel appears, apophenestai. I look at that bibliography and I think I would have gotten an F. <laughs> I don't think so. Jack didn't give out. Jack didn't give out Fs. <laughs> I see. I would, have, I would have skated through. Would have, would have he would have, he, yeah, you would have. Yeah. <laughs> you would have. Um, how does someone with this talent and um, energetic force get overlooked? You know, you, you, if it, I didn't do this prac, this uh, this um, exercise, but go to Google and um google charles olson poet and then google jack clark poet and uh and see i'm guessing it's at least a factor of 10 20 or 30 to 1 in favor of charles olson and yet the you know intelligent people say that he's pushed things as far beyond olson as olson did beyond pound which i think is quite an achievement so how do how do folks like jack get overlooked well he because he doesn't care he has no interest. He did has Olson, no did interest. Olson care? <laughs> well, to a certain extent, Olson cared. Um, not He didn't care in terms of, of, of a careerist kind of caring. That became clear in Berkeley when he did the Berkeley lecture. And he outraged everybody, you know, like, except for Ed Sanders and a, and a few people who stuck with him right through it. But, you know, Creeley and Tom Clark and and those, they were all just outraged that Olson wouldn't participate in the in the uh, manners of a poetry reading. He wouldn't. He didn't have the right manners. He like he said, "Fuck this! <laughs> I'm not interested in poetry readings. I'm interested in a nation of nothing but poetry. So fuck you! I'm going to drink my booze and I'm going to talk, and you and you can do what you you know. Stick with me or don't. Right." Um, so he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't interested, but it was a different time. And because of Olson's place in the New American Poetry 1945 to 1960, he became identified as a, quote, leader, unquote, of the new poetry. And he was a very outwardly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, he was powerful. He was extremely powerful, and people responded to that. Um, Jack, Jack's power was way more muted. He was he spent his most of his life in the English department at Buffalo, where nobody even knew he was there. When he got cancer, and and was dying, 
suddenly people discovered that he hadn't had a promotional raise in 25 years because he had never bothered to put himself forward to get a raise. He just, he couldn't be bothered. He was doing poetry, man. Like he didn't, couldn't be bothered with the other stuff. Just wanted to do the poetry. And then plus he wrote poetry that you have to be, you have to care about poetry deeply in order to engage with Jack's work. You can't be somebody who wants to, you know, get a cute little identitarian lyric, you know, about how much you've been done wrong by or whatever, um, or how much you love somebody or how much they love you or whatever. I mean, that stuff, that stuff for Jack was all part of located within a larger cosmology um, where it took on specific meaning. Like it's not, it wasn't about, oh, God, I love you, you know, she loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like that, right? Um, it wasn't like, it wasn't like the, the kind of ironic social commentary that you get from the ex language poets. I mean, that's all they do now is like ironic social commentary. It's like, who cares? I mean, really, seriously, teach me something, Charles. Stop repeating yourself. <laughs> If you, I read a, I read a, let me see if I can find this. I, Emil Alkali sent me this essay this morning and it's got a, um, it, it's, a, it's by a Algerian poet. Her name is, her name is Samira Negrouche. Samira Negrouche. And she, this essay is, which is just brilliant. But among other things, what she says at the end of it is, to resist, this whole essay is about resistance. To resist, it is important to get out of the repetitive vortex. To resist, it is important to get out of the repetitive vortex. And that's what those guys are they're stuck in a repetitive vortex. They're just going around and around, saying the same. But you know, they get famous, they get positions, they get money, they get prizes and shit. So that's good for them. Jack absolutely avoided the repetitive vortex. Absolutely avoided it. In, in the 70s, we would have said the record stuck, the record stuck, the record stuck, the record stuck. <laughs> I remember Carla Blay listening to her, some of her music and she actually did uh, the same notes. She had her band play like a stuck record. Which oh, I, know was just I know. I love her. I just adore her. Yeah. yeah. Just turned 85. Her birthday was May 11th, talking about oh, really? May 11th. That's right. 85 she's, years old. she's so brilliant as a composer and a musician, but the compositions are just stunning, you know? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, and she's my, like that. It's, it's my favorite, some of my favorite stuff in the world. And her last record, Life Goes On, Life Goes On, uh, just one of my most played 2020, according to Spotify. Um, running out of time here. Um, and. Um, Maybe we'll save a couple of minutes uh, after I turn the recording off to, to have a chat, which I'd like. But um, besides the article, which we'll link to, is there a good starting place for people intrigued by the work of Jack Clark? A good starting place would be, uh, well, the, the two books, the two books that you should start with are in the analogy, which are, that's the poetry that he was working on at the end of his life. Um, it's an, it's a, a fragmentary epic, which is perfect in a sense, you know. Uh, and the other book is, um, is the series of lectures that he gave at the New College in the 80s or the late 70s, I guess, uh, called uh, um, From Feathers to Iron, A Concourse of World Poetics. That's the one place, but see, even there, like, as I said before, you know, Jack puts it all into poetry. Well, he's giving this lecture and the footnotes in the lecture are poems. <laughs> so he's got it turned around, like everything's going back to poetry, right? Like back to poetry. Um, so those would be the two books, in the analogy. And, and if anybody's interested, I have, I have copies for people. I'm not sure where else you can get them except through me these yeah. days. Yeah. What use is someone like Jack Clark in an age of, 
identity and uh, cultural attention span that has become micro. What you uses he? <laughs> to those of us who are, don't want to participate in that fucking bullshit, he's absolutely essential. You know, he's one of the people that's essential. He brings you, he, he gets you home. He gets you home. And, and we're just getting further and further and further from home, you know? Right. Since I quit, I, I just, I didn't, I'm, I'm working on this now because I quit Facebook. Um, and I, I was on Facebook for, I don't know, 11, 12 years, a long time. And uh, now I'm deleting, I've deleted my account. And it's, the world changes. I mean, it may seem trivial, but there's a really deep change when you get away from that stuff. Um, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know where the world is going, man. I, I just know that where I want to go, I, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And, and I think Jack offers you a door, a door into beyond, beyond that, into something that's really serious and profound and important. It's all trivial, man. It's all trivial. Trivial arguments, trivial personal posts, trivial sense of community, trivial everything. It's all trivial. And what we really need is something that's not trivial, that's profound, that returns us. I'm starting to sound like Heidegger now. Right? It returns us from technology to being. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> 